In this video, we will be going over the second half of the Vanilla WoW game manual and comparing it with the current version of WoW. The manual lists all the classes and a little bit of info about them, so for this first part, I'll basically just summarize a few things that stood out to me and not be comparing every little thing. For warriors, it details the importance of the stances they used to have and lists some of the weapons they can use as advanced including the ability to wear plate armor, which I think was just kind of a leftover thing from copying D&D because it never really meant anything in game, other than needing to learn how to use those weapons from weapon trainers out in the world, rather than just starting out being able to use those weapons. For mages, it says, a fragile class with little health and poor fighting ability. However, they make up for this physical weakness with their awesome spell casting. Mages can dish out the most ranged damage in the shortest time. I thought that was funny. Mages are supposed to be a fragile class, which I mean, isn't entirely wrong today either. Mages are still kind of squishy. It's just, they also have one of the best defensive cooldowns in the form of ice block. Mages did have ice block back then as well, it's just raid mechanics have changed over time where a class with a full immunity cooldown is more valuable than a DPS class that just takes mildly less damage baseline. Also, the point about them being able to do the most range damage in the shortest time might still be true today. I'm not exactly an expert on which classes have the most burst damage, but I do remember back in Dragon Soul when guilds were progressing on the Spine of Deathwing, a fight which basically only required classes with the most burst possible. Half of the raids on all of the world first kills were comprised of mages for their burst damage. And from what I've read online, mages are still top tier when it comes to burst, but you know, not overwhelming like that. While the shaman, druid, and paladin can also heal, none of them can heal as well as the priest. Also, the priest has better resurrection spells than the paladin or shaman. Can you imagine a game in which the manual said something like this in an MMO today? Nowadays, all the healers are pretty equal. Priests just have two healing specs instead of one. Also, I'm not sure what it means about priests being better at resing. Maybe priests brought them back to life with like more health or something? Which I guess is technically better, but I mean, still not a lot. For the rogue page, funny enough, a lot of the stuff is still kind of the same. Other than the fact that they also have a list of advanced weapons they can learn. Fun fact about Cheap Shot. Cheap Shot is one of the few abilities in the game that still works exactly the same as it did in Vanilla WoW. Their powerful buffs are among the best in the game able to boost all attributes in addition to conferring strong armor and resistance bonuses. Their offensive spells, while good, are not meant as the druid's main strength. I love how the druid's selling point is their mark of the wild buff. Poor hybrid classes in vanilla, they just got the short end of the stick. Nowadays, they're properly balanced and no longer give that buff which was their selling point. Although, it is planned to make a return in the next expansion. The Pally page basically just talks about their auras and seals they used to have, plus mentions a few times about how they excel at fighting undead, which apparently was a selling point in vanilla. Nowadays, they still kind of have auras and seals, just not in the way that they existed in vanilla WoW. And also, they no longer excel at fighting undead, but they do have some, like, flavor interactions with them in one or two abilities. The shaman's unique power is totems. Totems are spiritual objects that a shaman must earn through questing. Once earned, a totem enables a shaman to cast totem spells associated with that totem's element. Totem spells can be purchased from a trader, although in order to cast a totem spell, the appropriate elemental totem must be carried in the shaman's inventory. Totems are almost exclusively cooldowns now, but that was once what shamans were all about, and their selling point. 
you no longer need to go on crazy long quests to get your totem items to be able to use your totem abilities. Elemental shamans can still drop four totems at once with a talent, but those are mainly just there as like a fluff way of giving you passive buffs and don't function like old school buff totems that gave everyone a buff. A hunter's pet must be kept happy or it will leave you and even turn on you. For those of you who don't know, hunter pets once had a happiness bar and if it was too unhappy, it would run away from you. Also, pets just lost happiness over time, so if you AFK'd in a city long enough without feeding your pet, it could leave you. Once a character achieves 10th level, it will begin earning talent points at the rate of 1 per level. Talent points can then be spent at the talents window. Every class has 3 lines of talents, not including a character's racial talents list. Alright, let's stop there. Racial talents? Now that's a new one. As many of you probably know, there were no such things as racial talent in Vanilla WoW. And in fact, I had no idea what this could be referring to, as I don't think it showed up in the beta either. But then I remembered a video I made last year, in which another YouTuber helped me out with an alpha client patch, which included skill points. So I went back and watched my video, and what do you know? Those skill points were indeed called talent points, and even had a TP next to their little indication saying what you needed to spend on them. Now, how these worked was that you got talent points as you leveled up, a lot more than one, and could spend them on an incredibly large selection of talents, ranging from giving 2% increased chance to parry while wielding a two-handed axe, not two-handed weapons in general, literally just two-handed axes. Also another for 2% more crit with two-handed axes, 2% more attack power, and so on and so on. Same for all other weapons and spell schools, like a talent to increase your holy magic skill at the cost of reduced shadow resistances. There were a ton of talents like this, going over a wide range of incredibly specific things, and actually looked really neat, if not a tad bit cumbersome. Although these didn't make it into beta WoW, so this manual might have had this part written during an alpha WoW development stage. Now to continue on with the rest of this article from the game manual. Talent points can be spent to purchase talents, which can do a variety of things. Many talents can improve your class's existing abilities, give you new abilities, or improve your class skills. All classes have the same talent points, but no single character can hope to acquire every single talent. Thus, there are many talent choices open to your character, and your choices will help differentiate you from other players playing the same class. Talents are still technically in the game, but they work nothing like how they're listed here. Nowadays, you get a new talent once every 15 levels or so, and you just choose one of three abilities. Also, there it goes again talking about class skills, which never made it to life. In addition, there are race restrictions on weapon skills. No warriors, for example, cannot use bows, while night elf warriors can't use guns. I did not know about this. Apparently, it was planned for some races to not be able to use certain weapons. I'm pretty sure that didn't make it into vanilla WoW though, and instead, races just got racial bonuses if you used a certain weapon, like trolls getting a bonus for using bows and dwarfs getting a bonus for using guns. To harvest an herb, simply right click on it. If you have the necessary skill level, you'll almost always open a loot window containing the herbs you found. If you get a message telling you that you failed to harvest the herb, simply retry it. Apparently, you could fail when trying to herb or mine. That is not the case today. Every character can learn up to two trade skills. This enables a player to be self-sufficient and choose one gathering trade skill and one production trade skill. Alternatively, you could learn two gathering trade skills or two production trade skills. No character can learn more than two trade skills. However, secondary skills such as fishing and cooking do not follow under this restriction. Notice how it doesn't list first aid as a secondary skill. 
Also, later on in the manual, it lists first aid under the production trade skills, like blacksmithing and leatherworking, which hints that first aid was meant to be a primary profession for some time. Nowadays, first aid is a secondary profession, although it is planned on being removed in the next expansion. Hearthstone can only be used every 60 minutes, so after you use a Hearthstone, you must wait another hour before you can use it again. Nowadays, Hearthstones have a 30 minute cooldown, and can be lowered to 15 minutes through a guild perk. But for the longest time, it did have a 1 hour cooldown that couldn't be lowered. As with aerial mount travel, only Horde players may use the Horde Zeppelins, and only Alliance players may use the Alliance ships. I assume this means you couldn't sneak onto ships as Horde and use them at one point? Because today, as long as you can sneak onto boats or Zeppelins, they work for both factions. It's just they're surrounded by hostile NPCs. Each race has its own unique type of mount, except for Torin, who are too big to ride animals and must resort to their plane's running racial ability. Yeah, that did not make it into vanilla WoW. Torrens were given Kodos to ride eventually. Now, all races can ride pretty much any mount, and there's just faction restrictions instead of racial ones. There are three auction houses in the world, a Horde auction house in Orgrimmar, an Alliance auction house in Ironforge, and a neutral auction house in the goblin city of Gadget Sun. Auctioneers exist within these auction houses and allow you to buy or sell items without having to go through the trade channel. There are now auction houses in pretty much every major city, and even in your garrison. Plus, they're all connected now. That was not the case in Vanilla WoW. Honor points. As you kill opposing players and special PvP-enabled non-player characters, you will earn honor points. You also gain honor points for conquering contested battlegrounds and slaying important NPCs, such as leaders and generals of the opposing faction. At the end of each day, these honor points will be distributed to all players who participated in PvP gameplay, with players contributing the most kills for their side earning the most points. These honor points accumulate to give you a PvP rank, which can fluctuate based on your participation and success in PvP play. Honor points basically worked this way in vanilla, and were later on changed into a currency you just got immediately after doing PvP stuff. And then today, it's just how you level up your honor talents. Dishonor points. Even among enemies as bitter as the Horde and Alliance, there is honor. If you flaunt this honor and engage in objectionable PvP play, such as killing new players vastly inferior to your level, or killing essential non-combat NPCs such as flight masters or quest givers, you will earn dishonor. If you accumulate enough dishonor through your criminal actions, you will be branded an outlaw. As a consequence, you'll suffer experience penalties, lose access to your own faction cities, and become so hated by even your own. Now, dishonor points did make it into the game, but they did not work nearly as drastic as it says in the manual. Dishonor basically just made it so you lost any honor you gained at the end of the week. It was like, just negative honor points. And sometimes people would group up with people who they wanted to lose honor points, and go around and kill a bunch of vendors and quest NPCs to tank their rating. However, let's go over a little bit more about dishonor points in the manual too. Recovering Dishonor World of Warcraft is forgiving of transgressions, and if you refrain from dishonorable actions for a long enough time, you will eventually return to favor with your faction and cast off your criminal label. So, it seems like you would have been able to return to normal plane status eventually. And finally, at the end, there are maps of the old world. Lots of it are still the same, kind of. The Cataclysm did change a lot of things around, but I'm kind of comparing this to like Vanilla WoW's version. But on the Eastern Kingdom segment, you can clearly see the island of Kul Taras, Tol Barad, and Zoldar. Tol Barad wasn't added to the game until Cataclysm. Kul Taras won't be added until the next expansion, and Zoldar is still not in the game. Zoldar is an island the Horde use in the Second War to stage their invasion into Lordaeron, and shows up in the first mission in Warcraft 2, I think. So all three islands have been in the game's lore for quite some time, but it's funny to see how close they are to everything on this map, and they are in such drastically different locations in-game. Alright, and that's it for this video for the most part. 
the rest of the book just goes over lore, and well yeah, some of that is different, but I wanted to focus more on the gameplay features. If you want to watch the first part of this video, just click on the thing on screen or check the video description. I didn't know they had planned on making you lose experience on death. This never made it into vanilla though, and was only in beta stages of well. You see, in other MMOs at the time, 